Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 930th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Matt Tabor, Nate Hyges, Phyllis Baldino, and Gabby Collins Fernandez. And we are looking forward to Fong Bui closing our program with a reading today. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter, and here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from today. And now to introduce today's guests and host, Matt Tabor is an artist and curator and the co-founder of International Objects and International Waters Galleries. Tabor's artwork deconstructs architectural systems through installation, video, sculpture, and painting. Nate Hyges is an artist, curator, and co-founder of International Objects. Since 2021, he hosts the Selection Committee, a music interview radio show broadcast live on Newtown Radio. Phyllis Baldino is a conceptual artist whose work merges performance, video, sculpture, and installation, combining an exploration of perception ranging from the everyday to scientific inquiry with extensive research to make work that creates its own logic. Her work has been featured in numerous solo and group exhibitions. And Gabby Collins Fernandez is an artist living and working in New York City, and we're very lucky to have her as a contributor here at the Brooklyn Rail. Um, thanks all again for being here and really looking forward to the dialogue today. Over to you, Gabby. Hi, thank you so much, Eleanor and all of the rail folks. And it's a pleasure um, to be here. And I'm really glad to be able to have this conversation. I've admired all of your work uh, for a long time. So it's really great to be able to be in conversation with you. Um, and also to be able to um, talk about perpetual screw, to talk about international objects um, and sort of work through, it's a really special um, uh, moment to be able to think about this show and what it represents and all of the ideas that Nate and Matt and their collaborators at International Objects had while putting together their shows, the importance of artist-run spaces, and of course, being able to speak with Phyllis about um, her work as a kind of highlight and perhaps crystallization of many of the ideas that are present in thinking about the exhibition. So I just wanted to start today, um, I wanted to start uh, the conversation today by asking Nate and Matt to give us a little introduction to the show. and. Uh, help us understand uh, what is Perpetual Screw? Um, and also, uh, how did you put together this show? Uh, why were you interested in tools and their representation as objects and as paintings? So I think um, just to start with that, um, I, I mean, first of all, thank you all for being here. And this is really great um, and happy to be doing this. Um, so I, I guess for us, like this has really been a dream show to work on. Um, it's kind of like one of these back pocket concepts that I feel like has been in our brain, you know, even since before the gallery existed. Um, and it, you know, selecting works for this show is also like, I, I mean, it was really just like a dreamy project. Yeah, it was a joy. Um, and, uh, and so <laughs> I, I guess just like a little bit of background on the galleries themselves. Um, so my partner Trang and I, um, Trang is wishes she could be here today, um, but we opened International Waters in February 2020, which I, it actually Perfect feels timing. it feels appropriate <laughs> to talk about that in this in this particular context because the gallery was very much a pandemic project. Um, we um, we essentially like um, had. Uh, Trang is also a design historian. And so one layer of, of our kind of conversations with artists that we were interested in showing at, at Waters was um, just kind of a blanket question if, if artists were making design objects as well. Um, it quickly became obvious to us that almost every artist we spoke to was in some form producing design. Um, and also in conversations that we've had with designers, 
most designers are also producing artwork. People have different kind of ways in which they characterize their own practice. And so like, you know, for some people like those modes of production are defined in different ways. Um, but that being said, it felt like, you know, kind of rife to like build a program that specifically highlighted that type of production. Um, and, you know, and, and for us, I think like this project, International Objects has like taken on a number of different forms before it actually opened. But the simplest like kind of articulation of what we're doing is, is that we're an object gallery. We're, we're a gallery that focuses on material culture at large. Um, sometimes we're showing artists, sometimes we're showing designers, sometimes we'll show mass produced design in the case of the hardware store that we're sitting in, for example. Um, and, and, and so I think for us, like, um, you know, the first exhibition, Local Objects, which I'm not sure if, um, if you all are familiar with, um, the first exhibition we had was really just kind of defining the category that there is this type of production artists are producing design objects, designers are producing artworks, and there's this kind of material um, discourse that is emergent between both categories. Um, and when we entered into working on this show, Perpetual Screw, I think, um, you know, kind of, we've been able to like focus our thinking a little bit around this category. And so, um, you know, just to like kind of establish what where we're coming from in, in a historical period, I think we've had a lot of um, a lot of thoughts about this time period as being related to the arts and crafts movement of the 1850s through the early 20th century. Um, our press release delineates a little bit of that, um, where we kind of talked about these early technology exhibitions. Um, that were happening across Europe, but really these technology exhibitions like, um, you know, can be, can go back to the Hanging Gardens of Babylon and the Archimedean Screw, like the, the, there are ways in which technologies have been showcased to relate to like a, you know, uh, a version of a, of a power um, for, a, for a social entity. And they've been kind of like in, in Europe specifically, they were a part of like a colonizing power. Um, showing technologies was a way of showing strength. Um, and it was like always like, a, I think we have a quote, but it was with a view of emulation um, where like, you know, somehow they're setting like a standard for the rest of the world to follow. In the, you know, post like 1850 time period, and this was not located in a specific place, this was happening all over the world. Artists who were now being surrounded by standardized forms that were coming out of the industrial revolution were starting to revisit handcraft as kind of a, a mode of, of production. Um, and the tools and processes that they were using quickly became like the subject of the work. People like the McDonald sisters, for example, were producing art and design flippantly. Um, and the subject of the work was the material process. And um, and we kind of like, I, I think, like delineate that period, you know, which is primarily like a European movement, but like it, it was happening, you know, in cities all across Europe, really kind of fit really nicely into how the ready-made also originated. Um, we spoke about Baroness Elsa, who like, you know, um, I mean, we're attributing the urinal piece um, to the fountain urinal piece that is normally attributed to uh, Marcel Duchamp. Um, but essentially like this kind of movement of choosing an object that is like a pre-existing form and embedding it within an art space and the kind of relationship of that object to forms of technology and how those forms of technology have like, you know, imaged um, new civilization or colonization powers. Um, we think that like that kind of mode um, of early appropriation really had its place there. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I guess like for us, like, you know, a lot of, a lot of thinking about that historical mode as it relates to people in this time period, it's, we're all living in a post pandemic reality. We're all surrounded by design and artists are also living in a context where AI bots are producing works of their own. Um, and it's really handcraft and our like sort of fetish of the material environment that separates us from that ecosystem. And so, um, so I think, um, you know, this kind of 
literal like look at at the tools and materials that are used to manipulate the physical environment how artists are complicating those tools and like sort of looking at the formal qualities of those objects um it feels it, it felt like a really relevant space to build a show so something that we've talked about a little bit um but which i think is worth discussing here especially vis-a-vis -vis these questions about temporality um and uh, like historical, these sort of like, um, like technology is this kind of uh, subject of history or something like this, um, is that a lot of the work in the show is actually quite funny and in some ways like kind of anti-functional, right? Uh, you've kind of presented uh, the narrative of how these technological impulses have been utilized in ways that are like pretty dark um, and also totally shape our environment. Um, but a lot of the work in the show um, doesn't really, it's like a lot of the work in the show kind of takes a sort of um, like a, an approach to tools and objects, which is really varied from having this kind of like punk sensibility to being intentionally useless to being um, kind of like useful, but in ways that are sort of out of place. Um, and I wonder if you might talk a little bit about tools and dysfunction in the show and this sort of attitude um, that isn't exactly, um, it's not exactly conservative, for instance, technologically conservative, the way that you might think that the arts and crafts movement was a rejection of these technological processes um, and has more to do with a kind of um, sensibility of resistance, but also a sensibility of jokes. I mean, you know, I think for us, humor is an important part of any good show, you know, um, and I think it's also, it's a mode of expression that feels really timely um, in terms of the way that people are making and thinking about artwork now, um, you know, and so I think there is, you know, there, I think there is a point of historical connection um, between the way that some of these people are thinking about their tools um, and thinking about how artists now have access to industrial processes in ways that we, you know, that's relatively recent, you know, like CNC machines, 3D printing, we actually have a lot of technologies um, that can help people who aren't specialists make things that they wouldn't have been able to make before. Um, you know, and so I think in that context, some of the artists, like for example, Andy Ralph, um, who is an amazing artist and included in this show, and Eleanor, maybe you might want to uh, show the slide of Andy Ralph's um, three tools. Um, oh, it was faster. He, up, 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 up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There, there. 36. Yeah, 36. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, so he's presenting what appears to be, you know, a kind of standard issue hammer, saw, and screwdrivers. Um, but the material that he uses for the metal components of these tools is lead, which is extremely soft um, and renders the tools totally useless. Um, yeah, I would I would say like also just to speak on on humor. Um, I think like for us like. There was actually like, a, you know, and when you're imagining the show before it exists, there was like a kind of, we were wondering if the show would be slapstick. Um, and I think like humor for us really acts as a relational model. It's like a way that people can enter into the work. But I think the formal considerations of tools, like in a, in a way, like, you know, for a sculptor, entering into a hardware store represents like the interface of sensible outcomes for the production of their work. Um, and so like the tools suddenly become like inseparable from this kind of process of the thing that is created. And for a lot of artists, like the formal qualities of the tools then become a part of the work. Um, yes. and so like, although that pathway is like, is kind of a funny pathway, it, it requires a deep kind of compassion for the material like sort of relationship and so for us like literally the reason that we're in a hardware store that we have one in the show is is like because we actually think that that interface is one that's really important it's it's one that all all artists and designers experience it's sort of it's funny the way you're talking about it now because it feels like a kind of funny uh like a perversion of medium specificity in some like mid-century 
century modernist kind of way, right? That if like the tool is the medium, um, <laughs> that might be part of the, you know, anyway, that that would be like the, the necessary limitation and parameter of making sculpture. But I also wanted to ask you also more specifically um, about ideas around labor that are also really present in the show, right? That uh, the way that you present, uh, I think maybe like the original pun of the show, the perpetual screw, which comes from a quote taken by the Baroness uh, Elsa von Freitag, uh, where she kind of like describes, like the, in the quote, she describes falling in love with the memory of her old lovers. Um, and their memories as this kind of eternal present, which denies their like possible like, you know, lapse into banality or boringness or decrepitude in the present, you know, like they're preserved in the image of romance of her mind. Um, but at the same time, you know, when we were talking about this, Nate, you described this letter as one where she's uh, asking for money, um, sort of asking for funds, right? And so I think that this idea of the perpetual screw vis-a-vis -vis like art objects and sculpture is pretty interesting, right? That as artists, we're kind of committed to this idea of like aesthetic objects um, that have this kind of emotional rendering or meaning at the same time that everyone's literally hustling, right? That you're um, even in the gallery, both selling art and selling tools. Um, and that in fact, many artists make their livings as art handlers, as the production of industrial, as the producers of industrial materials. Um, and that like this idea about labor um, and class position also seems like it's a part of the show. Um, and I'd like to, you know, maybe ask y'all for, you know, your commentary on this, but I think this also kind of points out one of the reasons why Phyllis's work is so central to the concepts of the show, that um, the way that Phyllis you make um, these objects kind of points toward the, the functionality and dysfunctionality of labor as it opens up into these other metaphors about domesticity, about gender, and about like production in general. I would, I would like to, before we talk about Phyllis, um, yeah. just to go back to the idea of, you know, the inclusion of artworks that relate directly to tools like Andy's work, um, and to touch on what you were saying earlier, there is a romance there. You know, I mean, there's an intimacy that artists have with their with their tools. You know, and it's sort of like the way that artists treat their tools can tell you a lot about them, and you know, like what kind of person they are. Um, you know, and so I think that like that's like that's also important, and I think that there is a direct connection to questions of labor there because it's a way of reclaiming that work and that relationship. Well, there's mm -hmm. there's also a bit of a Sisyphusian th thing there. There's like um, the tools themselves are laborers. Um, there's literally like, um, I'm, I'm thinking of Sean Krupa's paintings in the show. I don't know if we can um, jump to some of those, but um, uh, like with, with Sean, he's literally painting um, tools as sublime forms. Like he, he takes things like an auger or a propeller, things that are, constructed forms, but they're irreducible in terms of the way in which they manipulate the environment. Um, and he's painting, he's creating environments for those in a, you know, 3D rendering software called Rhino, lighting them and then painting from that space. And I think, um, you know, and is literally painting also perpetual screws and auger is a perpetual screw. Um, but um, I, I, I think, I think, you know, in a way, like for for these artists who are romanticizing the objects that they're creating, then are literally creating tools and and in this kind of formal mode, that that romance also relates itself to being an infinite laborer. Like the tool itself is an infinite laborer. Um, mm -hmm. A screw, a screw, infinitely will screw um, <laughs> until it breaks. Yeah, until it until it until dies. It stops being a screw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think Eleanor is going to show us um, a couple of those paintings. Oh, uh, it's a Krupa with a K. Yeah, Sean. Yeah, I mean it, it's really funny. I know that. Um, I I think also about um, as as I was walking through the show, I was thinking a lot about like. Um, other moments when labor and tools have been visualized as part of like social strategies. And I'm, you know, thinking about 
WPA murals um, and also like Mexican muralism where industry and industrialization is um, depicted as such so that the idea of the system, right? The idea of the, the screw which turns around us and which turns us becomes visualized as part of um, some, some of the larger social mechanisms at play that y'all were talking about earlier. Um, and, and yeah, I was also, you know, I think uh, both the tool, both the, the hardware store um, and also like the inclusion of uh, Art Handler, Clinton Lowry who runs Art Handler Magazine, which is also a popular Instagram account um, that collects and also satirizes the fetishization of tools and processes is an, is an interesting kind of a way of talking about these tools as sort of um, almost like metonym becoming metonyms of our own status inside of the art world absolutely um i think like maybe another interesting layer to talk about especially since we're in the hardware store is um we we consigned all of these tools from a local hardware store in ridgewood that um that specifically um has a it's Platts hardware in Richwood on Forest and Gates. Um, it's um, they they kind of have a reputation for being a place where sculptors can go to kind of figure out how to produce their work. Um, and so it's it's a it's a store where it's like you know you you it's pretty hard to find the thing that you're looking for. There's like an accumulation of tools and yes. in all directions. But the person David who runs the hardware store like just loves talking to people who are building things and loves like deconstructing a material process. And so this kind of mythologizing actually kind of does have an impact on the physical landscape of artists and their and their actual work. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the hardware store that David runs is, it is a, it's an emporium of time and space. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it bends reality. Uh, <laughs> And he is also like the person to go to if you need to attach an aluminum thing to a stainless steel thing to a wood thing. Yeah. Like he will tell you how to do it. Um, and the hardware store is adjacent to Yasue Maitake's studio because they're married. Um, and so their relationship also, I think, is like, you know, is a metonym of his relationship with the larger artist community. Um, and I feel like her work was also like ex really important for us as an anchor point within this show. Um, I, I, I feel like she has one of the best studios in, in, in New York, in the world, uh, where it's <laughs> really just, um, she, she benefits from a sculpture yard, um, behind yeah, a yeah, hardware that's store. Yeah, that is, that's her sculpture. And then we have two works on paper, yeah. um, also, yep. Yeah. Um, which were um, oxidized handmade papers um, that she leaves out on um, on building materials behind the hardware store. Um, so this one is a piece of paper that physically oxidized. Um, there's another one that um, that that one there um, that um, similarly oxidized over um, a piece of rebar. So um, yeah, I mean, like, so they're like artifacts um of time and process and materials um you know then they they're reminiscent of fossils or you know things that wash up on the beach um but they're also like a very clear record of an intention totally i want to make sure we get some time to talk about phyllis's work in depth before yeah. circling back to some other questions um about the space and some other ideas in the show um so I wanted to ask you, Phyllis, um, you know, the works that you're showing here, I know they're all made in 93, um, but the one of the impressions that I had when I was looking at the video and the objects is that they're both like, they kind of um, are simultaneously like pretty punk in their approach to um, uh, like furniture almost. And then they're also very charming. Like they have this very deep, charm and sensibility in terms of how um in terms of how these functional objects are made dysfunctional through like an application by uh like forcing them to, to contend with something else like the wine jug that's too big um or a different kind of material so 
I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about um, when you started making this work um, and how you uh, how you came to this this way of making and and this series itself, as well as um, some of the attitudes that seem really important in this body of work. Hey, um, thanks also for inviting me and um, and for going to the show, Gabby. Yesterday, that was nice that you went. I couldn't meet you there, but um, thanks for this. This series actually was the first, I've been working in video for 30 years actually, and this is the first series that I did was this series. And I actually found the book that I, this is the, this is the inspiration. Um, mm. <laughs> oh, Amazing. It's, okay, I'm, if you want to read it. Um, so it's called Fuzzy <laughs> Logic, the Discovery of a Revolutionary Computer Technology and How It Is Changing Our World. Daniel McNeil and Paul Freiberger. And this book was, and I mean, it's from 93 and I devoured it and it just was, um, it just really changed um, how I was thinking about objects. And um, my takeaway from reading this, even though there are many things to take away from reading the book was um, the gray area of life, not the black and the white. And um, Latfi, I'm sorry, pronouncing his name right, um, Latfi Zadeh, who he actually invented fuzzy logic in 1964. And then he was at UC Berkeley for many years. He passed away in 2017 at the age of 96, I think, or 94. Um, and he was one of the you know, forefathers of the computer technology uh, field and just really incredible. And his quotes in the book were just really, really great. And so that was my, that was kind of the, what started my brain thinking about um, about making this work. And so what I basically did was I went shopping and I went to all these thrift stores in, in Los Angeles. I was living in LA at the time and I bought all these objects, you, you know, secondhand. And then I altered them off camera. And then on camera, I kind of put them back together. But for me, it was about having an object be what it is and what it is not simultaneously. So you know, it's a wine rack, but it's, you know, it's got like a gallon, five, you know, a huge gallon of blush wine. Like, is it really a wine rack? Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, there's, there's all these um, things that come in, all these questions about, about functionality and the gray area. So that's, it's called the gray area series. There's 21 pieces in the series. And um, I saved all the objects actually. Um, and also this might be basic thing to say, but when I made this work, it was just me in my studio in LA. I, I got a video camera as a present. I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna make this work. It was so, um, I don't know. Uh, it was just a really, it was 30 years ago. So it was a long time ago. And um, it was just really quiet. I just, I, you know, I just made the work. I wasn't really thinking about the future. I just was really um, happy to kind of explore this idea. So um, it's, so that's kind of, you know, what happened. I also, I think it's really, it's, it's so interesting to have the objects in the show alongside the videos, um, because they, they occupy this pretty different kind of mode, um, where the first, you know, it's like when I see the object, I think this question, you know, the idea of the fuzzy logic um, is really clear, right? Because the way in which the object and its original function is recognizable and then rendered something else, right? Um, in this way, which is very funny, um, but also clear is like one kind of a statement, but in the videos watching you do these things as the actor, which, um, which is changing the function of these objects also seems to have um, you know, maybe to me, it kind of, it, it had this read around like um, a kind of like anti-aesthetic or like anti-domesticity in this way, or like, I guess the note in the note that I took, I was like, these videos feel like a kind of feral domesticity almost. Um, and I was I, wondering- If I just might interject, I think it is interesting to think about like, what is the traditionally male role, like male roles in inside of domesticity? Mm -hmm. you know, so I think that this is a little bit, you know, this is working that area, you know, and connecting to like the hardware store example, for example, is a space that's coded masculine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think that these videos are really like 
traversing gender, you know, gender issues in a very interesting way. Particularly because, you know, Phyllis, your co your costume changes with everything. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and you really, it does really range from like very butch to very glamorous. <laughs> yeah, because it, it would depend on the object, like the object told me what to do, right? Which the object still tells me what to do, actually. So it's, it's more like, you know, um, that's, that was just the way it kind of came together. It, it was, it was kind of a no-brainer um, as far as what to what to wear that went with which which object. It just kind of and my head is irrelevant. It's like who cares? You know, it's just it's about the action. Um, you know, and, and a few of them, uh, my head does exist, but um, it was mostly to get the shot, not really about my head. It was just about the action. Phyllis, do you want to just kind of like narrate, like make a narrative of one of the videos, maybe the tape case video, for example? Just to give the listeners an idea of like exactly what the structure of the videos are, like what happened. Sure, yeah, okay. Yeah, because they all have kind of a similar structure, but I think it's would be nice for people to really have a clear idea of what what happens. Okay, um, so this the tape case piece. Um, I bought this really ugly red tape case, and I think it was the Salvation Army in Los Angeles, and um, it was you know like that fuzzy you know the old fashioned fuzzy um, eight track tape. Um, and I think it was the same store. It was either the same store or another store on the same day. Um, I found all these eight track tapes and they were all the exact same tape. <laughs> and they were about some disco, you know, like how to disco or some ridiculous thing. <laughs> and there were so many of them and there were so many that actually fit the exact tape case. So I'm um, basically installing all the same tape in the tape case. So it's kind of stupid on purpose. Um, and then of course I, I, you know, you have to buy the ugly shoes to kind of match the outfit. Um, sure and that so. felt, um, you know, everything there I already owned, like they're just some, you know, black leggings and a, and a dance skin, um, you know, bodysuit. And of course the duct tape, which is uh, essential when, you know, doing this, it was just the, the easiest way to kind of, you know, put that together. Um, the other thing that I maybe can say is because this is my first work in video, I didn't know how to do anything with video. Like I knew nothing. And, um, the camera was a Sony Handycam. Um, and on the camera, there was actually a little, a little button you press that was the fade in and fade out button. So I would press the fade in button and I would walk in front of the camera and I would do the action. And then I would walk back and do the fade out. And in this piece in particular, at the end of it, um, and also everything was done in one take. So I just kind of made it up as I was going along, um, as I was filming, it was just like, I just decided to just do it. I, I didn't rehearse anything. And when it was done, the easiest thing to do was just to walk up to the, walk up to the camera and, and press the fade out button, like kind of from behind, from the front. And I didn't know what it was going to look like, but it actually worked out because it's kind of falling apart as I'm walking towards the camera. So I got lucky with, you know, like so sometimes blindly things just kind of happen when you just kind of do it. So that's that's a deconstruction of this piece. It's also so. really, I was going to ask you um, if you, I have two two questions. And so the first one is I, I wanted to ask you, I know that we're not looking at um, the works, any works in your practice beyond this moment, but if you, if there was a way that these first or early video works ended up influencing your work later, like is this itself, these strategies, did they become a tool? Um, and yeah, maybe let's let's start there. Like how has this shaped or affected your work since then? Um, well, the work is pretty much conceptually based. So each, each piece or series has its own kind of idea behind it. Um, I also was really influenced by John Cage when I was in art school. So I like the idea of chance and just kind of doing something without really planning it or, uh, or planning it too much. And so sometimes things happen unexpectedly, which is also really great. Um, I also am a big fan of Buster Keaton. So I think playing the straight man um, for me is also um, something I've always been attracted to. Mm -hmm. um so that's why these are kind of like they're kind of deadpan it's like you just do it you know and then it's over um, and they, I mean they are the, all of the videos are very funny mm -hmm. they really are 
I think I, also like it's it's really like the the kind of honesty of the work, like in terms of the material process of of you filming, you doing everything in one take, you kind of using the vernacular tools, misusing the objects, and then the fact that the objects are then on display in the gallery, like kind of not in situ next to the video, but in the general space. Like I think there's there's almost like a Dusseldorf school honesty in terms of the step by step conceptual like kind of propositional gesture that's being made, um, and and like I, I think it filters really nicely with like you know the chandelier not chandelier, um, as as kind of this syntax moment where you can really like start to <laughs> enter into like the the I, I guess kind of reflective aspect of the work. Well, something I thought that I was thinking about, um, especially talking about, you know, like these comedians and the ideas of like, you know, stage sets and props too, um, which seems like it's um, a, a part of your work is that it like the, the approach almost converts these objects, which we normally don't think about in the way that they like establish our sense of like a home, of gender as Nate was talking about, et cetera, as like, stage prop constructions um, on their own terms, you know, as systems. And like, I think it was when I was watching the, the wine holder, not wine holder video that I was like, this feels like such a funny um, application of the, it's like the funny fuzzy logic inherent in form follows function, right? Which is that like, what you did to that object was still make it a wine rack. It's just right. that it, it's just that it was already a wine rack to begin with. And the scale of the wine jug, right, was the issue in question. Um, and so it like repositions, it kind of like uh like saves DIY from this sort of like internet thing that happens where everyone is able to like bake their own sourdough into and like be the perfect curators of their own lives um, into this sort of approach, which is able to show how like you know you can retrofit an object to toward whatever need you might have of it but like it's not going to look pretty or it might not look pretty um while it serves that function um and i thought that this was really an interesting attitude to bring to the show um this 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 way of thinking about like the the anti-fetishism of objects in your work phyllis um, because I think so many of the other objects in the show um, are so invested in their own fetishization of tools. Um, yeah, for me, it was about, um, you know, the function, non-function, you know, it wasn't really about, um, yeah, I mean, um, the wine rack thing is just like, it's like stupid on purpose. I mean, you have a wine rack because you want to preserve the wine and, and you want to have it horizontal position because you, you have to like, keep the cork wet. I mean, there's all these, you know, issues with having a wine rack. And then, you know, you buy this, you know, really horrible, you know, jug of wine that's even called blush. It's not even really wine. And, you know, it's just, it's just so stupid that I just had to do it, you know. Um, I was wondering also maybe if we can like take some of these ideas back into the larger show too, because um, I know that there are a couple of objects, um, including most specifically, um, let me pull it up here, um, the the New York screw piece. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think um, the New York screw piece is like, is a really important anchor point for the show. Um, I, I, it really, um, it's by Malcolm Ransom, who is primarily a graphic designer. Um, this is actually one of his only objects that he's ever produced. Um, I think it like speaks to the kind of general, like, you know, sort of political mode that can be taken up with like this appropriation of tool, like a security screw, just for those of you who don't know what that is. If you're ever like in a public bathroom and you're looking at what a divider is mounted to the wall with, it's a it's a screw that has a very specific head to it that you need a very specific tool to unscrew. Um, and so um, so it's kind of to make a screw head with a Yankee logo is this kind of funny joke where where like you're you're taking from 
you know, the, the kind of esoteric hardware <laughs> solution, this kind of political gesture of, of being able to put something into a wall or into a surface that can't be taken out unless you have the power to take it out. Um, and to locate that within a landscape, I think is is a specifically really interesting gesture to make. And and so like, you know, as a New York object, I think it was a really uh, a special one for the show. It also just seems like it makes this sort of like, um, it kind of like it, and the reason why I brought it up in relationship to Phyllis's work is that it feels as though it has the same kind of dumb logic as the wine rack, not wine rack, um, where the idea of like this kind of fetishization um, is amplified. And I'm also now thinking about like the differences between in the art world and also where we are with objects between like 1993 and 2023, um, where, you know, the, the New York screw makes so much sense in terms of um, like self branding, right? The kind of enclosure of like the enclosure of the self and one's own taste vis like via algorithms um, and like how these kinds of design objects um, don't just represent good design anymore, or even like just class identification, but can become like this very, very uh, constricted representation of one's own identity, right? The idea that that would be the security screw um, is I think an interesting contrast. I mean, the discursive potential of these these objects is really like, it, you know, it can manifest in in so many different ways, which I think is why this this show really felt like it could could be infinitely expanded. You know, it's 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 something where like, you know, there are historical reference that um, we're constantly thinking of that are you know. Um, we were just having a conversation about Pippa Gardner yesterday, yep. and went, and I, I had the experience of seeing a Lily Lozano show in Paris last week, which was uh, incredible. Um, you know, and I think all of these <clears throat> artists are are really working within this kind of space related to the tools that are producing their work, and and so like the you know as a <clears throat> like I, I you know I think the elasticity also of how these things can signify is is really also a big part of this. It's like really a part of like a teleological expression of the artist's um, capability to produce their work. I mean, and I think it also connects to like, I mean, you know, the the New York screw is branded in a very specific way um, and has a, you know, has a discursive relationship to living in a culture that is like extremely interested in branding and very invested in that. Um, but I do think there's an interesting connection between like, you know, Neolithic tools of like using a rock as a hammer, you know, and like that, that connection is also there. And I think is really, you know, it's really important. And I think we've also connected this, you know, and, and this is like getting back into history, but also in, relates to how people are producing things in, in this time period. Um, you know, oftentimes the tools the tools represent a material exploit. And so uh, the way in which they're manipulating the environment is allowing for you as a human being to have a greater power over the material that you're manipulating. And so, you know, for people like uh, with like the Archimedean screw, which was irrigating the hanging gardens of Babylon, you know, for them, that was like, a, you know, humans were becoming godlike in their, uh, in their new creation of being able to, you know, create these like sort of architectural things that were were afforded to them by new technologies. Um, and so I think like, you know, that that was manifest in the Baroness Elsa when she's presenting a urinal as a fountain or a plumbing trap as a what she produced in the same year as uh, which is entitled God. You know, um, I, I, I mean, her 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 point was literally to kind of worship things that were initially deemed profane are usually behind the scenes and and are like but are you know relevant when seen in a different way so i wanted to we have about um you know like something like 10 13 minutes left and i just wanted to make some time um to talk about um as y'all are talking about the kind of um both teleological and also 
material opportunities afforded by this show about tools. Um, it also makes me think about like the artist run space as a kind of tool in a similar manner, right? That uh, there is a sort of function and um, materiality of uh, like the sort of ground up or artist run or, you know, kind of DIY version of the art world um, that this show also um, both performs and seeks to um, represent. And I'm also wondering if y'all could talk a little bit about that about the function of artist run spaces and about the kind of conceptual um, intervention that this show performs as such. Well, I, I mean, I would like to just take this opportunity to shout out our other two partners who were unable to be here with us. Um, Matt's wife, Trang Tran, who is amazing um, and, you know, is also one of the curators and is, you know, like a a very important part of our project. And our fourth partner, Annika Olson, who's a super talented graphic designer um, and has also been really instrumental in the gallery project. So I just want to shout out to them. Totally. And and like I I mean, ironically, out of out of the four of us, the two of us that are artists are Nate and I. Um and so I think I think the real um kind of crux of of like I, I I don't know we've definitely gone through our own sort of identity um sort of you know thinking or <laughs> thinking about being artists and curators at the same time but yeah. like ultimately I think you know and speaking for myself now where where we've landed on it is that the 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 production actually doesn't change a whole lot in terms of like at least for me I'm I'm like kind of an analytical artist and so the the creation of an exhibition and as like kind of a discursive mode is is very similar for me to like creating an installation or working on a video um and and i would say that like in terms of as this specific show relates to artist run spaces like i i think you know there's and maybe this isn't speaking to the specifics of this show but there's there's a lot of flexibility to a gallery model um, a, a gallery can kind of behave in a lot of different ways. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways that like, for example, like an institution is not capable of behaving just in terms of um, making, you know, sort of quick decisions and, yeah. and, and being able to like sort of work with the people that you wanna work with and do the things that you'd like to do. So in a way like, you know, with, with me, like the way that I got into this with International Waters, like, uh, International Waters really um, is a site-specific gallery in the sense that the floor is on an eight degree incline. We we joke about it, but we call it a shitty Guggenheim um, in the sense that it's it's like a 600 square foot room with an inclining floor. Um, it's a and, big, big ramp. Um, but but it, it really cuts to the core of, of an artist's practice when they work in there, because, you know, even if you're hanging a painting on the wall, there's an immediate set of decisions that need to be made in relation to your environment. And I think like for, for us, like in a, in a large part, like thinking about these shows, like a, in a certain sense, when we're working on a, you know, a 44 person group show or which is the amount of artists in this show or, or the previous show is an 89 artist show in a certain sense, like we're, we're, producing a show using the the sort of existing spectrum of of the artworks and artists works that we like really love and are influenced by and so um you know i i it's it's a different type of production but it but it does like in in terms of a sense of self aspect there is like a fluidity there it's I also mean, oh just just okay. just wanted to add that you know another thing that that we that's really important to us because we're artists, I think, is nurturing the community that we have around us. Um, because that's that's where we come from. And that's also like, you know, the people that we're drawing from in our shows who have been really generous to us. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we do is every Thursday, we stay open until 10 p.m. Um, and so people can come by in the evenings and just hang out um, and have a drink. Uh, we also do events. So we had a couple of weeks ago, the artist and musician Griffin Rue gave a performance on a musical saw, which seemed very appropriate. 
Um, and last week we had a screening of two amazing Chris Burden videos in collaboration with Electronic Arts Intermix, which was a fantastic event. Um, and in a few weeks, we're gonna have the artist, critic and writer, Jared Ernest, um, do a little performance. So, you know, that's also important to us. Absolutely. Um, I was gonna say that it's it's really, I think this show is, um, I think this this show is really interesting and uh, a, a show that has sort of talked about the status of sculpture in relationship to objects in a way that I haven't seen in a long time and certainly not in a way which is as freewheeling and um, and funny, you know, like funny and smart and deep and um, well considered in all of these different ways. Um, it also, I know it's sort of like a funny feature of this space, which is this kind of like still semi um, like unfinished industrial space that like all of the tools, many of the tools included in the show are like the tools that would have been used to finish the space, if not make parts of it. Um, and um, one of the things that I was thinking about um, in, in terms of the show and your project is how, um, yeah, how there, there isn't, uh, there isn't, it doesn't feel like there's as robust a discussion about what objects are literally um, and the way that sculpture as an object uh, has a kind of position versus scul like sculpture in the expanded field as whatever temporal technological iteration it might um, it might become. Um, and I think without wanting to ramble too far, I think this relation to the object, the status of the object in contemporary society, and the object as a kind of actor is a really uh, interesting and precise position to be exploring kind of as a conceptual program for the show. Because I think that kind of was one of the subtexts of local objects as well. Definitely. I think like, you know, a lot of these things are really like, uh, you know, we're constantly in confrontation with artificial environments, with computational environments, with constructed spaces. And I think for us, like, um, you know, and this is speaking a little bit to the experience of, uh, of you know, just how we ended up here. Um, but, you know, in the pandemic, I'm sure I'm sure you've noticed, but many galleries have left Bushwick. Um, you know, this this area was full of galleries um, and who have either closed or have moved to Tribeca or, or somewhere else, you know, and um, but none of the artists have left this neighborhood. None of the designers have left, left this neighborhood. And so in a way, it felt like there's like a bit of a vacuum here. Like a, it's really like this is the place where things are being made. It feels appropriate to talk about that. I think that's a great place to end the formal part of this conversation. Um, so thank you. All. I will say just one uh, last thing while yeah, we have this slide up on the on the screen. Um, this piece by David Bordet is um, a handmade bucket. It's not a found object, and it contains a living um, aquatic garden that is currently home to tadpoles. <laughs> So if you come and visit the gallery, you can visit the tadpoles who are quickly becoming frogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's gonna happen. But it's coming. There are lags now. <laughs> right. Yeah, go see the show, y'all. It's amazing. Oh, and, and it will not close on November 12th. We are extending the show uh, to the holidays. So oh. yeah, it'll so be our is, final for yes. show for 2023. Yes. So we have oh. more time to see it. But also come see it now. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Thank you so, so much, Gabby and Nate and Matt and Phyllis for that amazing conversation. It's such a unique and incredible show. So I'm really excited to see it. Um, our first question today will be from our friend GE. Thank you so much. What what an amazing show in so many different ways. So I, I'm watching as the show seems to be sort of this this bold synthesis of archaeology and paleontology and of course levity and everything that sort of overturns all these misconceptions about the arts and the processes. 
and human nature itself. Are you sort of asking in some ways the age-old question, what makes us so exceptional as a species? Hmm. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question to start with. That is a huge um, question. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for your compliments on the scope of the show. We're, we are trying to be ambitious. Um, and I think like at a very fundamental level, we are thinking about tools as an extension of the body. You know, and so I think if it's if it's not necessarily about human exceptionalism, it maybe is about humans desire to be exceptional. And I think and I think in terms of material exploitation, I would say that that's like a very open ended um, kind of basic um, like fact of of like human existence or or animal existence or, or plant existence, biological existence. Um, it, there's, uh, like, you know, if we, if we need to build a home and we reshape the environment to do that, you know, there's, um, and we're using tools to manipulate that environment, there are degrees of exploitation that are occurring. And I would, I would associate those same mechanisms of exploitation with computational outgrowths and, and new technologies. Um, so I mean, I don't know if that completely answers your question, but I think it's like, a, I, but I do think like the focus of tools and hardware like is is very like, um, you know, it's a it's a large subject. Um, one, one of the artists who we didn't talk about, uh, Deville Cohen, um, is he's he is a co-member of a group called Artists Commit, which is dedicated to interrogating the environmental impacts of the art world and like our lives as artists and as you know viewers of art um you know and so i think and like and the, the sculpture that he has in the show is um a light a kinetic light sculpture that also has a solar panel um and that's part of you know the yes exactly thank you eleanor um you know, and so that's that's part of it too, is that, you know, like we definitely, you know, are also thinking about, you know, what are the larger ramifications of the, you know, like the, our activities on this planet. Thank you so very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the great question, GE. Um, if anyone else would like to ask a question, feel free to send a message in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and and I would like to ask a question um, to you all. Um, I am really interested in the showcasing of objects or one, one way that I kind of read this show is kind of focusing on process and sort of sh almost shedding light on the very uh, physical, you know, ways that art is created and kind of blurring that line between process and finished product um you know turning the process into an artwork in itself um and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that um in the context of a gallery um in the context I mean we've definitely heard about how international objects is definitely a unique um sort type of gallery and you know, subversive in various ways, but I would love to hear more about that, uh, you know, focus on process rather than finished product in the, in a gallery context. Yeah, I think um, in terms of like, I, I, I mean, we do definitely have a focus in like a larger material culture. And I think the relationship that artists and, and designers have towards like their physical environment is, at some point always like kind of a counterpoint to other forms of production that exist around us. Um, and so um, so I think as a gallery and 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 really like I don't think this show will be the only one that um, like kind of positions us against arts and crafts movement. Like I think I think this gallery is thinking about like the labor of producing artwork as a ritual process. Um, that is very much engaged in the discursive potential of the forms as well. Um, and, and you know, um, the discussion of labor is certainly a part of that. I mean, it's it's not just coming from the fact that, that we're artists as well. Like, I think it's really like coming from sort of, a, you know, 
to produce in the physical environment is almost counter to the current technological landscape that we're all subject to. There is a there is like a counter move that is being made any time that you pick up a physical tool and a physical piece of material. Um, and um, and so I yeah I think like that those those moves even even if it's not on its surface subversive like I think I think there is like kind of a political operative at play. Yeah, and you know also I just want to say that like <laughs> uh, everything in the hardware store is for sale. Like it's an active hardware store. We just consigned the things from Platts. Um, for sale at the same price. Yeah, actually. for sale at the same price. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Distinction. No, right? there's no upcharge. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it was important to us that that this space not just be a sort of like fetishization of the idea of a hardware store, but that it actually be usable. And we've sold a bunch, you know, we have sold, you know, a number of tools from here, um, from this space, you know, to Working also, artists. we should say, I don't think we mentioned it in the context of this talk, but Arcana is a design group that we yes, work yeah, with to you. produce the hardware store and specifically a part of this artwork that's not visible from the inside is the fact that they've created like all of these like sort of hardware solutions that are then visible with anchors on the exterior of the store so it's it's kind of like a like a hellraiser skin of of like different anchors all of that exist um on the walls around around the space and like our our you know feedbacking into like the kind of manifestation of the hardware store as yep. a as a space itself that's amazing. Thank you both so much. Um, Chloe is now going to ask another question or comment on behalf of the audience. Yeah, I just want to read this comment that came in from Paul in the audience, because I think it's kind of a generative comment for the two of you to respond to. It says, since humor keeps coming up, it's amusing to consider the title of the show as an indirect reference to the sometimes difficultly justifiable perpetual obligatory challenge we welcome into our lives as creative people, artists, designers, writers, curators, and so on. I love these things. I love looking at these things, love thinking about these things. I love making these things. These things are what I am and what I do. I'm perpetually screwed. And without them, I'd be even more screwed. So anyway... <laughs> As I type this, you're addressing human exceptionalism. Somehow that adds to the humor. Um, and I wonder if uh, you have anything you'd like to respond to that with. I mean, I'm a fan of Paul's. <laughs> 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 Thank you for that comment. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, yeah, exceptionally well said. Um, you know, I think that that really goes to the heart of, you know, what it means to be an artist and what it means to be a creative person. And also just like, what it means to be a, a human too so totally. i think um and maybe this is speaking to the first question as well in terms of the theory context for all of this i think like there's um there's a kind of emerging synthesis of labor and desire um that's not something that's like new for us to think about like the situationists were writing about that synthesis point like specifically like formulary for a new urbanism uh, yeah. by ivan chechlikov well and i mean marx um, too and yeah totally I mean, yeah like uh and and so i think like you know every time like you know you might be working today i might be working today but more than likely we will both be working on our phones and we'll both be making the same kind of body gestures um to um perform a variety of tasks and later today i might go and buy a book or or something on my phone and then you know those the process of consuming and the process of my laboring are are effectively the same process um, and, and so I think like in terms of our mediated experience of the world and with our landscape, like the kind of emergence of, of technologies shaping the way in which we experience things and the architectonics that like are kind of controlling our, our, our movements in that way. Um, like, I think that that's increasingly relevant for us. And that's certainly something we're going to continue to highlight in our program here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do think that what, you know, part of our project is, to work against that undifferentiated space. Or at least to reveal it, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chloe, for reading that. Thanks, Paul, for sharing those thoughts. Um, 
and now um excited to um pass it over to our publisher and artistic director Fong Bui who will be reading to conclude today and before that just again a huge thanks to Nate and Matt and Phyllis and thank you oh yeah thank, thank you, you so, so much. much thank you so much yeah, yeah thanks it was such a such a blast um and it's an amazing show congratulations um and now Fong over to you Thank you, Elinor. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Matt, Phyllis. <laughs> and also thank you for, where is she now? Gabby, uh, for being the host as usual, extraordinaire. I haven't seen the show, but I can't wait to see it. I love the premise of the show. It kind of goes beyond the 1917 Lusham Fountain, you know, at the Society of Independent. And I was thinking about Soft tyranny versus hot tyranny from Alexis Tocqueville. And I was thinking software and hotware. <laughs> Don't be young all of that. Thank you, you guys. So I thought of reading this poem that I wrote on the occasion of a, a huge public reading under the banner of House Divided, organized by our two friends, the artist, poet Stephen Bondel and the great legendary Bob Holman the founder of Bowery Poetry Club, among other things that he's been doing forever, in Banjo language being one of them. But anyway, they brought together our friend and, you know, from different disciplines, including artists, writers, other members of our creative community, from Paul Oster, Amina Baraka, John Jono, the late John Jono, who we admire, Mark Ribo, Joseph Komini Yaka, John Jonas, Ann Wortman, Marilyn Nelson, I don't know, Ed Sanders even, Richard Serra, uh, they they all came together, uh, coming together as a collective effort in solidarity to address the national political divisions, actually, in Sunday, April 30th, 2017. And it was held at Cooper Union. And I remember wrote it the night before, so I like to read to you guys, called My Divided House. I remember growing up in a divided house, a discontented citizen, confused, self suffering member of an old family grown new. You and I separated by an indivisible war of an unbroken ideology that existed long before the mind learned how to dictate the body, I remember growing up in a divided house. My grandfather was a resolute communist. My grandmother was indifferent to the People's National Liberation Front. They rarely look at each other's eyes at dinner table. I remember the burning sun at dawn on New Year's Day of 1968, how the light was quickly dimmed by the immense flocks of helicopters like swarms of mosquitoes hungry for blood after a long monsoon season in the lowland. I remember it was more awe-inspiring than the opening scene of Apocalypse Now with the end by the doors in the background, more memorable than Operation Lightbacker 1 and 2, more picturesque than Operation Rolling Thunder and what not. I remember I was even more exhausted than Operation Chopper before I was born. They were indeed the mothers of Operation Desert Storm and the bombing of Iraq in 1991. Whatever operation that keeps me here and you there, victimization is just a catchy phrase. Why Tricky Dick is relishing his Chateau Lafitte Rochelle one afternoon. I remember the screams of the wounded being drowned out by the scream of the bereaved. They were everywhere on the street leading to the pagoda of the celestial lady. I remember on the temple's wall how serene Buddha was sitting in profile under the Bode tree in the shelter of the natural world. I remember chatting with my grand mother, let my skin and sinews and bones dry up together with all flesh and blood of my body, 
but I will not move from this spot until I have attained the supreme and final wisdom. I remember the law of desire, Mara, presiding over the enormous elephant with many sharp tufts, sending his most beautiful daughters to seduce Siddhartha. They fell, for he remained in deep meditation. I remember on another wall a vast army of monster in the form of piercing arrows aiming at Buddha's front torso. They too fell, for he remained in deep meditation as they turned into adoring bouquets of flowers on the ground behind his back. I remember Malcolm Brown's black and white photograph of Tick one duke cell immolation in the busy street of Saigon long before it was called Ho Chi Minh City. The flames burst forth to consume his body, but he had gone, long gone, before the spectacle. I don't remember when I was told there was two kinds of human beings, those who aspire to move forward and those insist on walking backwards. Who else care enough to look at the bright sun and the shining moon and ask me if it's too late to love one another? I was taught to remember, to keep my precepts with all the purest of hearts and be humble in the divided house, north and south, left and right, here and there, now and then, I will always be forever caught in the space between my finger touching the earth. Nirvana is nowhere else than here. Amen. Thank you so much, Vaughn. Um, and thank you again, Nat and, sorry, Nate and Nat, Phyllis and Gabby, um, and to the team at International Objects. Also, um, Annika was, very helpful. Um, and thank you to all of you for tuning in today. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for supporting our archive on the Rails YouTube channel where this conversation will be posted shortly. For the past 23 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics in our free monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate um, to support the work we do at The Rail and keep your eyes out for our November issue, which is coming out very, very soon. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Christine Weil, Lauren Rosenblum, uh, Jen Brodovich, and Jennifer Field on the event of a model workshop. Um, Margaret Lohengrund and, contempor and Contemporaries at Penn Center, New York. Um, you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as we leave today. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks to International Objects. Um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. And go see the show. Congratulations, you all. Yeah, please come yes. visit us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Congrats.